Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Bill Maggio, the Chief Executive Officer of the Jacobs Institute, Executive Vice Chairman of the Board of Collider Health, and Managing Partner of Lorraine Capital. I am speaking to you today from the offices of the Jacobs Institute right here in Western New York. And let me start out by saying I want to thank all of our remarkable speakers and moderators for their time today. I am certain you'll be fascinated by this afternoon's conversation. The Jacobs Institute, also known as the JI, has consistently brought people together and led the conversation about what is possible in medicine and healthcare in the next quarter century. It began with the release of our Future of Medicine publication in 2017. We are a forward-looking independent nonprofit. Our mission is to accelerate the development of the next generation of medical devices to treat vascular disease in patients, such as heart attack and stroke. We do this through the forced collisions of physicians, engineers, entrepreneurs, patients, researchers, and industry. Our board chairman, Mr. Jeremy M. Jacobs, has demonstrated his robust support for medical innovation through the University at Buffalo Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Science and the Jacobs Institute, of which he is one of our founders. The JI is a perfect vehicle to deliver a visionary report collaborate with UB to present an ongoing lecture series and to launch a podcast which also bears the future of medicine name. On the podcast, I interview thought leaders in research and medicine on a variety of topics featured in the reports such as pandemics, public health, data analytics, artificial intelligence, robotics, advancing immunotherapies, just to mention a few. The podcast, which is available on our website and anywhere you listen to podcasts really, is meant to help our listeners make more informed medical decisions and understand what policy and societal shifts must take place in order to usher in the future of medicine. Now, in 2020, we are facing an unprecedented and profound healthcare crisis that our collective generations have not seen before. Think about it. This pandemic is, imp is impacting the lives of every human being on this planet. Our daily lives have changed in every single way imaginable. Healthcare, the delivery of healthcare, education, commerce, global travel, family and life events, and so much more. What struck me was that our Future of Medicine report actually predicted a viral pandemic, stating, and I quote, by 2040, a combination of megacities, climate change, increasing global populations, and higher rates of international travel will result in the first influenza-based major pandemic of the 21st century. This will galvanize political will and spur development of technology to accelerate vaccine production and distribution, end quote. As we race to find a vaccine and keep our global public safe, the time was appropriate for our lecture series to take an impartial and unbiased approach to this topic and to ask the questions, how can we prevent this? And how can we thrive? This pandemic itself required a reimagining of even this event into a virtual format that we are using today. The Jacobs Institute values collaboration and partnership. We are pleased to host this lecture in conjunction with the University of Buffalo's Dr. Steven Schweitzberg, a great friend of the JI and professor and chairman of the Department of Surgery at the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. He will serve as one of our moderators of today's webinar, along with our founder and Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Nick Hopkins, and Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Adnan Siddiqui. Just one house cleaning item. To facilitate communication, please submit questions using the chat feature located at the bottom of your screen. The moderators will try to address as many questions as possible once the presenters conclude their talks. Now, Dr. Schweisberg, thank you for your valued partnership in hosting today's webinar. I turn the floor over to you, or shall I say the screen, and I'll speak to all of you in the question and answer session. Thank you, Dr. Schweitzberg. Bill, thank you so much. It's a real honor to collaborate with the Jacobs Institute. Uh, we've developed UB RISE, research, innovation, surgery, simulation, engineering, education, and we're a perfect partner uh, to work with the JI, who is pioneering research in vascular disease and neurologic diseases. And it's been an honor to work with you on the Future of Medicine projects. 
Uh, we've been interested in educating uh, high school kids, particularly from disadvantaged neighborhoods, mm. for STEM education. We've been fostering education for our medical students, engineering students, and business students by presenting grand challenges for them. And we've been engineering, public health, business, biomedical informatics, education for surgical residents to help inspire tomorrow's leaders today. And, and with that, it's uh, such an honor to introduce uh, our friend and partner and, and a visionary and somebody that I truly look up to, previous chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery for the University of Buffalo, a real pioneer in neurovascular neurosurgery and vascular surgery in general, and a, and a good friend and founder of the Jacobs Institute. Uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nick Hopkins. Thanks very much, Steve and Bill. Um, the, um, the program you're going you're gonna to see today uh, is uh, innovative. It's, it's quite a bit different from most of the COVID type material that you see uh, day in and day out on your screens. Um, and the idea was to try to go at it from a different slant and to, and to try to recruit some of the world's experts in various aspects uh, and I think we have, we have an amazing uh, group of speakers. Um, I'll introduce uh, each one of them briefly now and then let them hand off the, the, uh, the bat baton to, to the next person. We're, we're going to start with Steve Galster. Um, Steve is actually joining us from Thailand where he actually lives and works, uh, but he's all over the, the world, especially in Asia, um, because he is probably the world's most foremost expert in zoonotic transmission, meaning the transmission of viruses from animals to humans. Um, and uh, and he's, he's on a campaign to try to figure out how to eliminate that. If we can't eliminate some of the zoonotic transmission, we're never going to prevent this in the future. So that's, that's Steve. Uh, the next, uh, well, let me, let me say the next speaker um, is um, Stephen Morrison. And Stephen is at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, and he's considered one of the foremost experts in public policy as it relates to pandemics. He gets a lot of his funding from some of the major corporations, including Microsoft, and is a, just a world-renowned expert in, in anything that has anything to do with pandemics. Um, the third speaker, uh, a, a, a great personal friend, is Amar Sahani. Uh, Amar is uh, truly one of the most successful serial entrepreneurs in the history of, of the Silicon Valley and Boston area. And, and Amar um, is going to talk to us about uh, the impact of COVID on, on industry, both large and small, and what we can do to, to, uh, to help industry thrive and prosper during this and future uh, pa pandemics like this. And our last speaker is our own Ken Snyder. Ken um, is an MD, PhD um, uh, biophysicist who um, is uh, also head of, of the entire COVID program at our institutions in Buffalo. Ken has more detailed knowledge about COVID and uh, the, the, the virus itself, the way it impacts humans, uh, the things that we're doing for it and can potentially do for it in the future. Um, he knows more about this than anybody I've ever met, uh, and so I'm really looking forward to Ken's and all the other speakers. Um, and so with that, why don't we just go right ahead and let me introduce um, Steve Galster. Steve, do you want to go ahead and give us your, your uh, take on, on the uh, zoonotic transmission? Sure. Thank you, Nick, and thanks for having me. Good morning from Bangkok, everyone. Uh, I am not a medical expert. As you were noting, I work more on uh, wildlife trade, been doing that for uh, almost 30 years, as long as, as well as uh, human trafficking. Uh, my organization, uh, Freeland, works around the world to help uh, basically investigate and campaign and stop uh, illegal trade in, in wildlife and, um, and human trafficking. And for many years, we've been uh, you know, pointing out the, the, the potential danger of these animals being vectors of uh, disease transmission. So uh, but, uh, the fact that we're talking here today, I think is, is the way it should be. Our sector should be interfacing more with, with your sector to develop a, more of a one health approach. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, Amar Sahni for, for uh, facilitating bringing me here today. 
So I'm going to share my screen here and talk a little bit about Okay. All right. Are we good? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So yes, Freeland, uh, we're based out of the States in different parts of the world, uh, working to counter trafficking of people and wildlife. And I'm also a bit of a national security buff. I, that's where I got my start was actually in the world of uh, national security, looking at war and bombs, et cetera. And, you know, the first thing that occurred to me was that COVID-19 really is a, is a bomb and it erupted in one country and spread to other. And the more we learn about what's happened before, I mean, this really is more, more negative impact than uh, any, you know, terrorist act or natural disaster in the last hundred years. And this is important, I think, to point out from, from, from my sector, which I would call the sort of development sector, because still to this day, uh, the, uh, the disaster is, is being treated uh, not so much from an environmental point of view, but from other points of view. And in the environmental sector, just doesn't have the capacity or authority to deal with, um, with, with such huge impacts. And really, the, the last pandemic that was worse than this was just a little, a little over 100 years ago. About a, a third, of the, third of the world. And, you know, what we've been frustrated by is people are continually uh, debating if they're talking at all about, you know, where COVID-19 came from, uh, you know, whether it was from a bat, from a lab, or from a pangolin in a wet market, or whatever. And what we've been trying to point out is it, it doesn't really matter which one of those it was from. We know that this is a, a zoonotic outbreak, uh, like many before. MERS, Ebola, HIV, SARS, bird flu. And these are happening more often and they're getting stronger. And really some of the main root causes of causing these um, COVID-19 and the other zoonotic outbreaks. One is the rising commercial trade in wild animals, which is bringing people into much closer contact with wild animals that have been brought out of their natural environment um, in unnatural ways, oftentimes under stress conditions, carrying pathogens for which we have no uh, immune response. And the other main reason we see behind these uh, expanding uh, more frequent pandemics is the destruction of wild habitat, which is the push factor. These animals have no place to go. If they're not being traded, they will move uh, into areas of high human population. And a lot of times we have to note this destruction of wild habitat is for the purpose of creating uh, industrial farming, including uh, factory farming. Because so, as we know, these uh, wild animals are not always uh, transmitting these viruses directly to people. Sometimes it's going through uh, domesticated uh, livestock and other kinds of animals. So. You know, while the world is chasing this vaccine and, it, and the vaccine, uh, you know, pursuit is really dominating global headlines. Um, and we're also seeing stimulus and recovery checks and packages put together enormous amounts. Um, what we're frustrated by is the fact that, you know, a new vaccine uh, may very well not work against a new viral strain. So these will amount to expensive band-aids that just are going to need frequent changing. Now, I'm based over in Bangkok, so my, my team out of here has had a particular focus on looking at the region uh, for the outbreaks and wildlife trade. And, you know, where I am in Thailand, they've done a, a fantastic job flattening the curve on COVID-19. I can walk around, I can go to work, I wear a mask, we still get checked temperature wise. You gotta be wearing a mask wherever you're going. Uh, but, you know, people are going up to bars and restaurants again and it's not um, in defiance of, it's not, you know, it's, it has not become a political thing. It's just people are starting to slowly feel like they've, they've beaten the curve, but they're not taking it for granted. However, uh, at the other time they've left one door open uh, which is the wildlife trade. There are wildlife trade markets across the region. It wasn't just Wuhan, China that had markets. 
Um, this is a picture out of a Shadow Jack market downtown in Bangkok, just a few miles from where I'm sitting right now. And these are recent shots. Um, Indonesia, you know, we talk about bat trade. Uh, Indonesia has one of the biggest uh, uh, commercial markets for, for bats. You can still buy them in grocery stores. You can buy them outside. Uh, Myanmar is still some unregulated uh, wildlife trade going on, particularly up near the Chinese border. Uh, these are pictures that we took, um, different kinds of animals, civets, monkeys, uh, bear paw, et cetera, next to each other. You can imagine the, uh, the potential for uh, disease transmission here. And then very importantly, something uh, I've been very heavily involved in personally is monitoring the, 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 the cross-border global and regional trade. Um, this is a picture of uh, Thai Navy officers with uh, environmental officers also who uh, seized a shipment of tigers and leopards and penguins, which were all commingled, uh, moving across borders. And you know this is not an atypical uh, uh, case where animals are commingled, uh, sometimes shipped live, sometimes freshly dead across borders. And then you know you've got officers also handling the um, the, the, the the seizures. But you know Asia is not alone uh, as a vector uh, rise here. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, you know, our, our country, the United States, is, is, is also a potential uh, big factor in this. This picture, the uh, uh, United States is actually the second biggest importer of wildlife in the world. A lot of people don't know that. It used to be the first. China is probably currently the first, but the United States is the second. And um, there's, you know, there's a repository of confiscated uh, wildlife uh, parts out in Denver, Colorado, if anybody ever wants to get a sense, it's like all kinds of species that you would have never thought of. This included on the, on the, on the picture here coming into the US and people have been talking about pangolins. There were 35,000 pangolin products imported into the United States for various communities uh, that were seized over a 10 year period. And usually that's you know a two to 5% uh, indication of what what really made it across the borders so and you know there's been a focus uh, by some organizations on this fact that you know there are markets around the United States and here I think it's important to point out you know we hear a lot about wet markets wet markets are basically you know outdoor uh, produce markets you know the, the place where you go buy vegetables uh, but also maybe meat, et cetera. So wet markets have been getting a bad name. They are not necessarily wildlife markets, but there are some, as we saw in uh, Wuhan, that, that, that sell them as well, but they're not the only problem. So the, you know, as you said before in the opening, this, is, this has happened before. Uh, SARS back in 2002, 2003, we had an outbreak there, uh, went across borders, people got concerned. China's response, SARS broke out, as we know, from a, from a civet, which we see in the picture there, uh, onto people, probably sold on a menu. And China's response at that time to SARS was to uh, pause the markets, destroy a lot of animals, like 846,000 uh, animals were destroyed, and then to increase regulation. That's what the response to SARS was. Okay, so I think what we've learned from SARS is that that's not enough. You know, that was a compromise because it happened again. You know, the market in Wuhan, people might think was some crazy market where there's blood flying everywhere. That market in Wuhan was a highly regulated market. One of the more regulated ones um, in that country. So I think the, the lesson here is to adopt what, they, what we're calling a, a one health approach. So Freeland is a, a founding member of a new allied campaign with about 34 other organizations. It's called End Pandemics. And we've tried to bring together different organizations from these different sectors who know about animal health, uh, human health, uh, environmental health, as well as agriculture, business, technology, communications. And it's really One Health is a risk-based governance of health of the animal human environment interfaces. And in this very fancy slide, the, uh, 
the basic message is that prevention is the best way. The costs that come in at the end of a, of a, of a pandemic or the way we're doing things now is, is, is very big. So what we've tried doing at the End Pandemics uh, Alliance is put together a solutions hub that integrates these different approaches from stopping wildlife trade. We wanna end commercial trade in wild animals. We feel like we cannot compromise anymore. Now, China has taken great uh, measures, uh, even talked about banning wildlife trade. They have done it for some time. The city of Wuhan it has banned it for the next five years, consumption and trade. But uh, the trade in China alone is $74 billion a year. So you can imagine the pressure by any, everybody making money in this trade to push back. And, you could, and, and across the region, we're seeing the same uh, kind of compromises where people are starting to talk about uh, regulating the trade better. You know, that there's certain species that are high risk but others are okay. So we're going back to SARS right now. This is what we're very concerned about is that this kind of pandemic is gonna happen all over again because we're focusing on finding a vaccine. Uh, we're not taking the wildlife trade seriously enough. The United States is not even really talking about its own wildlife trade, even though it's the second biggest importer in the world. and we just feel that uh, we need to, A, integrate our approach, be working with the medical health community, working with the agricultural community, uh, business, consumer behaviors, et cetera, integrate approach and create this one health um, approach to preventing pandemics. Prevention is gonna be the cheapest way because we none, none of us wanna go through this again. So when we think about wildlife protection, we need to start thinking that it also helps with, um, with uh, human protection. So I'm gonna stop here and switch over to uh, the facilitators who are gonna play a one minute video which has been playing on CNN in different parts of the world. Uh, our friend Jane Seymour, the actress, uh, thankfully um, offered her voice pro bono to this, so you might recognize that. And, uh, this has been playing uh, around the world and it encapsulates basically what our campaign is about. Thank you. We knew it was coming. The signs were all there. Mm -hmm. We knew we had to change, but we didn't. Destroying wild habitats, exploiting wildlife, turning a blind eye. Maybe it would go away. It didn't. It began to bite back. Primates at HIV, civets at SARS, bats and Ebola. COVID-19 is not the first pandemic, and it won't be the last. Unless we deal with the root causes. It's time to stop the wildlife trade and to support compassionate, sustainable farming to protect our planet. Let's change our relationship with nature forever. Oh, and uh, that video was uh, sponsored by a company that has a, a fresh perspective on protecting the environment because they also know it's good for business and people. It's B Grim. It's a conglomerate based out of Thailand. And that, that uh, one minute spot has been playing reaching about 600 million people across the world. We're basically just trying to wake people up to the, to the need for this kind of reform to change our relationship with nature because at the end of the day, that's really the more sustainable, affordable and workable vaccine. Uh, so thank you for listening. And I, I guess I will turn this over to the other Steve. Steve, before you go away, um, I wonder if you might just make a brief comment about, I mean, I, I can see some wildlife <laughs> food as being attractive to some people. It's hard for me to even imagine why bats became a something that people want to eat. I don't I don't understand it. Do you know how that all happened? And 
Yeah, uh, well, in short, uh, bats are consumed for two reasons. One as a delicacy, uh, like a lot of animals in this trade, people might think they ingest the powers and also it's just something special to treat another person to, shark fin, tiger bone soup, et cetera. But also uh, as a medicine, because uh, they, they're, basically there's a certain uh, part of the bat that they will uh, grind down into medicines to improve eyesight. Hmm. People's eyes. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, let's proceed with Stephen. Stephen Morrison, you want to thank go ahead? You. Thank you, Nick. And uh, thanks to Bill Maggio and Stephen Schweisberg as well for the opportunity to be here today. Um, it was through Fred Kasravi, uh, who's connected to many of you here and who's a, a trustee of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where I work that we were brought into contact. So it's a great thrill to be here today. Um, just a couple of comments around where we are in this, in this pandemic. The first thing I wanna just emphasize is how pernicious this particular virus is. It's novel, it's a form, uh, it's an upper respiratory novel virus. We have obviously no immunity to it. Uh, it, when, it when it arrived, uh, and became known earlier this year, no vaccine, no cure, and no therapies. We made some progress on therapies. We'll talk a little bit more about vaccines, but it travels very, very swiftly. Uh, it, um, it, it does have uh, fatal consequences, but the, but the percentage of fatalities is, is not as high as things like SARS, which burned itself out by having a 10% lethal rate. This is more in the order of 1%, sometimes less. It has 10 to 15% extreme illness. And its transmission, which is very, very fast, uh, 25 to 40% asymptomatic with a one month lags in seeing the, those impacts. So it can move through a population very rapidly uh, in, 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 in its spread. We're beginning to understand that it has multiple impacts that are long-term for those who survive in terms of assaults upon the brain, upon the lungs, obviously, upon the renal, upon kidneys, uh, and it throws off, it throws off clots and, 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 and can, can, can induce strokes and the like. Uh, we had hoped there would be seasonality impacts and that we would see some retreat. It's had limited uh, seasonality. So we're in this cycle right now we're nine months into this and and we there's still many uncertainties surrounding the virus uh the science around children the science of what kind of long of immunity do do we acquire and how long does it last so we're only nine months into this and already we're beginning to see some major efforts begin to try and review where we are today the Independent Panel on Pandemic Preparedness and Response had its first meeting. This is the panel brought together, by, uh, commissioned by the World Health Assembly last, uh, last spring in the midst of all the controversy surrounding actions by the Chinese and others. Um, it had its first meeting today. Helen Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand, and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, former President of Liberia, co-chairing this effort. Twelve very diverse and esteemed experts on it. We also have the Global Pandemic Monitoring Board, which was created after Ebola, issued a major report last week, and the Lancet COVID-19 Commission has begun its work. So people are not waiting around to see further resolution. This is an ongoing global pandemic, and they're beginning these efforts. Um, so it's a good time to sort of pause and reflect on what are the challenges and some of the major issues that have surfaced now in this first nine months. One of the mega, mega questions is, will we, in the face of this profound pandemic, unlike anything we've seen in the world in 102 years, will it break the cycle of crisis and complacency that afflicts efforts at health security? What I mean by that is, investing in preparedness, investing in the sort of defenses Steve Galster was suggesting, uh, some a very important portion of this, but investing in the basic capacities to detect, to prevent, to respond to these novel 
dangerous agents that appear, these pathogens, is an enterprise that has, that has had a very tortured history. A tortured history in which um, the crises appear, there's a massive mobilization of effort. People discover that, in fact, we're not very well prepared. The virus outstrips our efforts. There's a long hustle, various initiatives are launched, but then as the crisis fades, the attention fades and the investments and we lapse back into complacency and neglect. So the big question is, this time around, will it be different? Will the outcome be different because of the profound consequences that we have not just a health crisis, but a cascading economic crisis, somewhere between 12 and $20 trillion of loss lost economic value in the globe in a mere nine months, and a social instability and food insecurity crisis that's been induced by this. Um, many people are somewhat cynical about these type of studies, that they gather dust, that the, many of the recommendations are not followed, but there's also many very notable instances where recommendations that are made actually have pretty significant enduring impact. I participated in one of the reviews uh, of the Ebola crisis, the London, Harvard, uh, Harvard, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the Harvard uh, uh, Chan School of Public Health. Um, there were seven notable of these uh, uh, notable uh, studies undertaken in that time, and they converged around some common themes. Um, they did result in a strengthening of the WHO Global uh, Emergency Program. They did give rise to something called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiatives, CEPI, which was charged with investing dollars in the development of vaccines and other countermeasures for pathogens that we know of, but for which there's, no, there's been market failure and a need to get moving very rapidly. And CEPI was formed in 2017 as a result and has moved front and center in the response to, to COVID and the development of vaccines. It's, actively developing nine of the candidate vaccines. But we have to remind ourselves this time around, we're dealing with a planetary crisis. It's planetary in scope. It's not confined the way Ebola or SARS or some of the others have been confined. It threatens the livelihoods of every corner. Uh, it's had, and, and it's, it's created this cascade of economic and social instability. Um, and, and, it's, and it's not over and it's, and, it's, and it's cycling through and we're not sure exactly what, how, how quickly we will be able to arrest it. We'll say more about the vaccines in a moment. One, a couple of things that jump out uh, in this period. One is the diplomatic void and the other is the stark disparities that this is exposed. When I say a diplomatic void, there's been a, a startling absence of high-level statesmanship and diplomacy uh, in response to this global crisis. And why is that? And I think we have to begin some soul searching on that. And it's rooted in hypernationalism. It's also rooted in the fact that the United States and China have found themselves in the grip of an escalating confrontation between the two of them, which is an unraveling of their own relationship which has descended into a lot of recriminations, conspiracy theories, espionage, and various, and various recriminations. It has paralyzed, that fact alone has paralyzed the UN Security Council um, and, 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 has, and, and has led, I believe, to the G7 and the G20 doing very little in this regard. There have been successful cases, and we'll talk a bit more about that. It's certainly in Asia, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Republic of Korea, Singapore, uh, have had very notable successes that are rooted in the searing experiences that they had with SARS and, and pandemic flu 15, 16, 17 years ago. And the determination that was made by those, by those governments to build capacities, to break that cycle of crisis and complacency, to get a consensus nationally around what was needed and to acquire the testing capacity, the capacity to chase down outbreaks, isolate, marginalize, conduct contact tracing, um, and, and do it in a, in a, in a way that's respectful uh, of civil liberties. Uh, you look at those successful cases, um, 
it, it, it's it's dramatic and, and quite impressive. But you also we also need to step back for a moment and and realize the the stark failures, the larger story, which is China's failures at the very outset, which made this which made the the spread and release possible, and we can talk more about that. But also the catastrophic failures of governments that, by most measures, are the best equipped to manage something like this. And the most obvious is the United States, which is which has ranked in the estimations of preparedness. The Nuclear Threat Initiative (NTI) did a global analysis of preparedness of 191 countries, and the United States ranked number one. But we are now number one in terms of caseload, deaths, dislocation, and the like. But we're not alone. We're not alone in, 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 in showing uh, uh, catastrophic failures that run up against the expectation that something we should have been far better. If you look at Brazil, you look at India, which is rapidly surging towards the United States levels. You look at Russia, South Africa, and the United Kingdom, you see a pattern that a very disturbing pattern. The other thing I'd say is gro the gross disparities and inequities. The gross disparities and inequities that have been exposed by this are of two types. One is the degree to which the pandemic, the virus, exploits our own social and cultural disparities so that those who are poor, those that are in our society, people of color, are bearing a grossly disproportionate burden of the disease, of the fatalities, of the, of the extreme illness. But there's another disparity, which is between those who are the wealthy countries, the most powerful countries, which have been the worst performers, but which remain very powerful, as against low income and lower middle income countries. What we saw during the early phase of the response, when there was an urgent need for test kits, for reagents, for protective gear, uh, for an ability to get oxygen, assisted oxygen and, and ventilators and the like, was that the market forces uh, were, were, were dominated by those who were the most muscular and most wealthy, and that there was a crowd out effect and, 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 the, uh, and the low income and lower middle income countries had a great difficulty accessing, uh, accessing those markets. Right now in the scramble for vaccines, which is a very promising effort, there are nine vaccines that have entered human phase three trials, there are 30 that are in human clinical trials. It's a diverse uh, a set of vaccines, diverse in terms of the modeling models that are being um, pursued. But the interesting piece is that the, a small subset of the wealthiest and most powerful countries have locked up 4 billion doses of the future production. So there's this huge uncertainty as to, as the, as, 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 uh, safe and effective vaccines come forward in the future, um, where are they going to go? And, and there has been one initiative, what's called the ACT Accelerator. It was an initiative launched in April, led by the European Union, uh, the World Bank, WHO, Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, and, and the UK and some other governments, um, which sought to create a formula in which you could bring in self-financing countries as well as donors uh, to uh, try, attempt to try and guarantee affordable access to vaccines, to therapies, to diagnostics by low and middle income countries. So there has been this promising, uh, this promising initiative, but it's one that the United States has not bought into. It's one that Russia and the China, China have not bought into. And it's one that's future is not yet secured in terms of the financing required. Um, I did talk about a bit about the U.S. paradox, the fact that we're the best equipped by most measures, yet our performance has been catastrophic. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about why that is. And it comes down to, it seems to me, three broad set of categories. One is leadership at the level of the White House and, and the White House leadership of the, of the executive branch. It's been political culture, the fact that we're so deeply divided and we're, we have been prone to politicizing things like masks and the response. And a third is just the underfinancing and understaffing of our local public health capacities. Um, and that is, and, and, and we're struggling with that and we're gonna struggle with it in this next phase. Um, the diplomatic 
what I saw, talked about the diplomatic void and the dominance of, of, a, of a sort of hyper-nationalism, um, it, it begs this question, what's gonna get us out of that? What's gonna get us to another level at which it's possible to begin looking at these issues on a global level around what is it gonna take for coordination? On the successful cases, the Germany's, New Zealand's, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam, they all exhibited decisive, consistent, and coordinated national leadership. The very thing that's been missing in most many of the Western cases, guided by public health experts with the respect of science, respect of public health and the best available science, and an enduring consensus within their societies and a trust and confidence in public authorities, but also in science and public health. Um, what do we need to do here? I think most of these studies that are underway are going to come back to not just fill the diplomatic void and begin to reach beyond ourselves, but also reinvest in the basics. That is the basics for health security. Um, and that is developing and implementing national, national health security action plans, systems for testing, early warning and detection, data collection, the basics that we know of. And there are already the tools for doing judgments and evaluating what is possible and what is not. And there's already been many studies around the affordability of this, that you can create national capacities in low income and middle income countries at about $5 per capita per year. One issue that I want to touch on briefly uh, is around the question of WHO. The World Health Organization uh, has gotten caught in this escalating confrontation between the United States and China. Uh, President Trump announced April 14th he was going to suspend funding and do a review, and six weeks later announced he was going to sever the United States membership in WHO. We are the largest donor, we're the most important don partner with WHO, and we've begun a one-year process of severing our membership, and we've suspended funding and are diverting funding elsewhere. Uh, the uh, allegation has been that the WHO has fallen prey to uh, excess pressure from, from China and has become a, a de facto accomplice in the views of the Trump administration in, in, in the deeds that, uh, that the misdeeds that are alleged against China. What is it that WHO is going to need in this next period if we believe that there's still value in this institution? Um, it's going to need inspection power. It's going to need greater surveillance capacity. And that requires member states to yield some level of foreign, foreign um, uh, some, some measure of sovereign power. The Atomic Energy Agency, the International Atomic Energy Agency, governments of the world have yielded it the, the inspection capacity on nuclear weapons in, in compliance with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The question in front of the world's leaders is, does this pandemic reveal to us that we are under threat, that our microbial universe is one that's gonna throw forward these types of devastating threats? And we need some agency that we trust and that can be competent, that is able, if you have a government that decides to deny, to, to obscure, to obfuscate, to, to use time critical, to use up critical time when a dangerous pathogen has been discovered, but it's kept under wraps. Um, how do we guard against a, a, another cover-up of that kind? And, and, and we need to really confront that issue head on. And I, I'm, I don't underestimate how difficult it will be to create the kind of diplomacy to make that possible, because you can imagine the sovereign sensitivities all around the globe around having, uh, giving power to an international organization to be able to, to, to enter. A couple of other things. We know, I mentioned earlier, that there's been promising institutional innovations. ACT Accelerator, which is, which is moving ahead with a vaccine facility. CEPI, which is developing these countermeasures for uh, and getting through field trials. Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. All of these deserve strong support in consolidating their progress in their future, securing their future. We have to come to terms with the internet and the weaponized social media and the fact that um, the, the public trust in government, media, and institutions has declined and anti-science -for forces have ascended. 
And this is fed by weaponized social media, by falsehoods and paranoid conspiracies. And what are we going to do about this? This is an issue that we're going to have to come up with some concrete measures. So I'll just close. I think that the UN Security Council, UN uh, Secretary General Guterres and the Security Council are going to have to play a major role. And we're going to have to come back and look at renewing the G7 and the G20 and perhaps take some measures out of the climate change movement at creating some kind of recurrent uh, gathering, much like the Conference of Parties for Climate Change to review progress and put a focus on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. And I think um, that was just amazing, amazing insights. Uh, and let's, let's now hear from Amar about um, the impact on industry. Amar? Thank you, Nick. And I uh, really appreciate uh, your giving me the chance to uh, come here. Thank you, Bill and Steve uh, also. So I will take a little bit of a narrower view uh, around the medical device and the biopharma industries. And uh, as you know, you know commercial uh, enterprises all over the country, all over the world are being heavily, heavily impacted. Um, but it is critical since this is a medical issue that is uh, confronting us that uh, these uh, companies uh, that are providing critical products and services as well as uh, innovation uh, continue to survive. So uh, I, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm uh, with my partner, Fred Koshravi, whose name you heard right now. Uh, we've been involved in a number of uh, medical device companies, um, you know, founding several uh, companies ranging from ophthalmology companies to neurosurgery, cardiology, spine, et cetera. So uh, that's our background. But uh, now jumping into uh, uh, the area of sort of what's happening uh, with the exposure of this pandemic to the industry, uh, how is it impacting the medical device industry overall? So uh, I'll first try to go through sort of what, what's happening, and then hopefully we can start looking towards what can be done about it, what are some immediate steps that can be taken, and what are steps to be taken in the midterm, long term, and then how is society overall going to be changed? How is the patient overall going to be changed? And what do we need to be doing to be prepared for the future? So if you look at the medtech sector, the medtech sector varies from people who make big machines, uh, you know, MRI machines, imaging, robots, things of that nature. And those, are being, those companies are being impacted considerably, in, at least initially, because in the midst of a pandemic, nobody wants to buy and expand in big capital purchases and stuff. The long-term views are okay on these places, but the near term is not looking good. So they are impacted probably the worst. Uh, the ones that are impacted next worst, not as bad as them, but next worst are procedures that can be put out for some period of time, whether they are pacemakers or you know, back surgery or uh, uh, cataract surgery or things of these, which can be postponed for some time. So the pressure builds up over here. Eventually, people need to get these procedures. And when the recovery happens, the recovery will uh, happen relatively quickly. And this pent-up demand will be relieved. But there are a number of people putting these procedures out. And companies that are going to see a contraction in revenue, and you, we'll talk about how they might be able to ride this stuff out. Some companies are relatively immune. These are the ones that are managing chronic diseases like diabetes or wound care, et cetera. Uh, the patients have been getting these types of therapies and products for a while, and they will continue to kind of uh, get them. The major thing is to make sure that the supply chains and these types of things don't, don't get disrupted. And there may be some new models uh, that can be done to be able to make sure that the patients are continued to be provided with these uh, products and services. And then there's the hustle. There are a number of companies that are sort of modifying what they were doing to be able to kind of uh, 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 meet this new emerging demand that the COVID situation is uh, determining, whether it is, you know, uh, asking GM to start making ventilators. Uh, not a great example, but, you know, um, that's kind of what happened. But there are companies that were making eye drops for anti-infective work that are now making nasal drops out of those. Uh, there are companies that were making uh, drugs for uh, uh, respiratory distress syndrome that are now uh, deploying that towards uh, the cytokine storms and stuff that are happening people who are making uh, improvements in uh, ventilation systems that are now coming up with trying to wean people off for ventilators better. So there's all kinds of different hustles that people are doing. And the question is, these might prevent, present some good near-term opportunities, but where do they go for the longer term and is that sustainable? 
But the most important thing probably is sort of the financial strength of these uh, institutions. Now, that was the larger company perspective, people who actually have revenue and, and uh, existing commercial products. But earlier stage companies, particularly the universe that I live in, which is uh, in the entrepreneurial world, where companies don't have products right now, but are trying to get products out, clinical trials are becoming really hard to do because uh, com- you know, hospitals are in urgent mode and they don't want to undertake clinical studies right now. Uh, manufacturing is in flux. You can't space out operators when your manufacturing lines have people sitting next to each other. It's hard to do. R&D work is limited. The number of people you can put in with social distancing is uh, hard. If you've got a small facility, how do you do this? Medical conferences are canceled. A number of the things that we used to do to discuss medical advisory boards and clinical meetings, et cetera, uh, uh, those are all sort of canceled. Uh, sales calls for a number of uh, sales personnel are uh, harder, impossible to make. So new accounts can be developed. So these are all sort of challenges that the smaller companies are also facing. So what do we do now, soon, and in the future? So immediately, I think the first thing is to hunker down and saying, okay, let's set up a crisis response team because all kinds of crises uh, are going to be coming to us. And how do we actually manage them so that there is a, uh, you know, you, it's sort of you have to expect that crises are coming. The second is to sort of sit down and look at alternate business scenarios. What happens if Latin America shuts down completely? What happens if, you know, the materials we used to get from China are no longer possible because some trade war or something else is adding to the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, flights are not going anymore. So outlining saying, you know, do a pressure test across the organization and most importantly, start preserving cash flow and ensure that you have financial stability uh, in the organization. Once that immediate stabilization has happened, then we can look towards sort of the business growth and continuity of it. What a lot of companies are starting to do is simplifying their business operations. So if they, for example, Boston Scientific had a business in gynecology and in urogynecology and urology, they have decided that urology is a better place to be. So they are spinning out the gynecology business and selling it off. So non-core assets are being spun off. Um, People are protecting their top line because once you start dropping price, uh, of your products, very hard to recover. When the business cycle recovers, raising price would be very difficult. So what they're doing is instead of sort of dropping the price, looking at smart pricing in which they can add on some service or contract or shipping or something else to be able to kind of improve the offering. Uh, and uh, instead of going wide in accounts, they're going deeper into accounts so that they can, uh, you know, you can't open new accounts right now. So salespeople aren't permitted in a lot of places. So going towards a deepening of the account. So these are things that people can do to kind of start looking towards planning business continuity. And ultimately, if this virus is going to be there or these pandemics are going to be something that come every so now and often, you have to adapt your business to this and say that you can't just have business as usual. So in this regard, there may be actually several acquisition opportunities. So companies are acquiring new businesses which are more in line with their narrower focus or more direct focus. While they're spinning some things out, they're acquiring other things. If you were looking toward ever doing a business model transformation of going from services to products or services to more automated services or integrating more robotics into your business, this is the time to start doing this and start doing the business transformation and eventually also commercial transformation because if your reps are not able to get to the hospitals, then how are you going to reach people? So if you are thinking towards inside sales versus outside, you know, having reps or looking towards e-detailing, things of that nature, more analytics into it, this would be the time to kind of pursue those commercial transformations also. So as I mentioned, the financial stability part is probably the most important because if you don't live to fight another day, you're not going to be able to survive this crisis. So immediately you have to put no regret cost reductions to manage your burn, whether it's at the SGNA consulting projects that are not immediately contributing, marketing campaigns that may have diffused returns, uh, low performers that are not you know, going to be able to make the cut, you will have to take some difficult decisions and pass on those uh, uh, and, and generate those savings. And be prepared. This is like going out and for a long journey. You better have a lot of fuel and you better figure out sort of what's giving you the maximum return on these things. Evaluate how much liquidity, working capital, et cetera, you have and uh, figuring out sort of, you know, as I mentioned, some of the smart pricing things and look towards divesting certain non-core assets, figuring out what is it that's a core and sort of go towards more of the core. And for ultimately, pipelines are important, but you have to kind of do a dispassionate analysis of which of these are going to be core growth and nice to have, and don't worry about the nice to have stuff right now, 
but focus on the core and some of the growth things and look towards what the potential upside would be, what the return on investment would be and sort of reprioritize the pipeline. Once that is done, you can start looking towards the future. Once the business is stabilized, you can look towards saying, okay, what other new solutions that I, uh, could the company offer? And these may be parts of pivots in the, uh, with the COVID-19 uh, process, like we talked about. Um, they could be options of uh, growing the team instead of only cutting low performers, not only hunkering down, but there's a lot of good talent coming available and to be able to expand your team. Uh, we actually just closed a financing um, a couple of weeks ago. We're going to close another one next, uh, next month. So this is actually a good, there is money in the system. This is a good opportunity to bring in some good talent and, and grow, the, grow the business. And as I mentioned, you could transform the business for the new normal. If, if the new normal is pandemics are there, people are gonna be, there's gonna be less interaction face-to-face, -face, more automation. Some of these types of things we have to be prepared for to kind of make sure that if we have to deliver remote care, more diagnostics upfront, all of those types of uh, transformations might be something to consider. So looking at startups, what can they do to be a little bit more resilient? Uh, some of these things that apply to larger companies apply to small companies too. Managing expenses, which is budgets, freezing, hiring, et cetera, non-critical projects being put on the back burner are a given. What we are trying to, starting to do is we actually share employees with other companies. So just like people are forming social pods, one thing could be that you know, startups in an area could kind of band together to share certain types of employees, whether they are regulatory folks whose demand may be sporadic uh, and expense can be considerable. So we are tending to share some of these individuals. Uh, we are conserving cash by paying with options for some people who may be in a position that they can take stock options instead of cash. We're using a lot of consultants rather than dedicated resources while consultants may be expensive. You don't have a fixed burn. So you can kind of do that and certainly cutting ties with uh, low performers. And also continue to make robust progress by getting high uh, grade talent as we spoke about. And we are starting to go to geographies where the COVID crisis has blown over a little bit. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan. These places, the COVID situation is a little bit more under control and we are actually starting to do clinical trials there while the US clinical trial situation is still a little bit dicey. And certainly we can kind of you know, improve upon our documentation and quality systems. Other things that we can do on the fundraising aspect, uh, certainly the PPP funds have been accessed by a number of the startups, uh, including our, some of our companies. And there are other government resources available. But there are unconventional uh, funding sources, uh, family offices, uh, being able to do uh, deals for Asia, China specific rights, et cetera. But it is important to make sure that you get the cash you need. Uh, what we're finding some of the startups uh, that I've been talking to are sweetening their fundraising deals by offering uh, you know, uh, uh, an, an extra option or uh, uh, a share of stock and of common shares in addition to preferred shares that you buy. So things of that nature that make deals more attractive. This is not the time to kind of get really cute. This is the time to get the resources you need. And there may be some pivots that you could make to get into uh, COVID related products. Uh, that's certainly a possibility, uh, uh, but don't force it because this storm, if it does blow over and you've kind of completely shifted your business direction, you will find yourself uh, misaligned in your strategy. Uh, there may be uh, FDA uh, emergency use authorization, the breakthrough designations, which are provide a shorter path to revenue that you could pursue. You could also look towards business combinations and mergers. Usually I'm not a big fan of two startups merging together, but there may be opportunities here that synergies dictate that it does make sense to do that. Uh, you may look towards creating products that don't need clinical studies. So this, again, the path to commercialization could be shorter. You could look towards telehealth, digital health, robotics. These automation and information technology oriented medical devices will enjoy a robust growth, particularly in this time. So in terms of if you're gonna pick targets to work on, those would be the areas to kind of work on uh, more so. But overall, I think big picture wise, there will be big changes taking place in health systems, in the patients, as well as in society overall. And we have to kind of start thinking about how we will position ourselves to not only hunker down, to, but to be able to prosper and thrive in these. The health systems, which have been cutting costs for a while, suddenly find themselves faced with a surge of need. And they are having a tough time sort of responding to that. If they had a little bit more preparedness, more stockpiling, et cetera, they would have done better. A lot more testing, finding that test is, uh, is the lack of testing and making life really difficult. 
uh, but diagnostics that could be done at the home point of care, you know, at the CVS, et cetera, if they could be done, that would improve things a lot more. So I think those are coming, but it's taking some time, but we will see these things happening in the future. And being able to do automated production, scaling of the opportunities, et cetera, through robotic technologies will be, will be important. But the US public health force needs to sort of massively expand. I think, uh, unfortunately, some of these things, vaccines, antibiotics are not sexy in terms of investment from venture capitalists, but they present massive public health dangers. And the government will need to step up to be able to kind of either invest and do things in this area. And we will, as Steve mentioned, need to re-engage with global public health organizations. We cannot become isolationists in our view. So health systems will change in this fashion. Patients who are a little bit scared and right now make a kind of a assessment as to the risk benefit of going to see a doctor versus getting COVID in the process. Uh, do I really wanna go for an X-ray? Do I wanna go for my dental visit? So what we will find is that telehealth will increase. Telehealth, which for a while was sort of relegated to a one corner, will become a more important attribute. Uh, digital first expectations, whether it is from identifying a doctor to booking appointments, et cetera, will need to become a more standard of care. Um, more things will move towards the home in terms of and these are all opportunities also for people to develop new ideas and new products. Uh, more uh, emphasis on home-based care, whether it is for chronic diseases or for identification and consults initially. And social determinants of health, which is something that we never thought about, are gonna become more and more important because clearly our lifestyle and environmental factors, including whether or not we have a job or we've lost our jobs, will have a major play into how we uh, manage our health. And the society, I think, will undergo a significant amount of trauma. There is mental health challenges that are coming about from this, and we will need to have mental health professionals who manage us through this, because some of these, we won't even see these effects until much later. Certainly, we'll see some direct effects on people's health uh, later, but also emotional effects. Uh, this coupled with sort of the economic challenges of layoffs, et cetera, and social instability that is coming about from the wealth disparity and the opportunity disparity that's coming, are gonna be plaguing our society for some time. So we need to be prepared for this to be able to react to it. And we'll significantly need to expand the caregiver pace to be able to respond to pandemics such as the COVID process, as well as when the work reopens and for future preparedness. So all of these, while they present a significant challenge, I would say that they are two sides of a coin. They also present significant opportunity if we are able to kind of take the positive view and saying, Let's just understand that the world has changed and we are going to make some changes in how we approach things and what we're going to do and how the entrepreneurs will respond to be able to look at it from a positive perspective, a glass half full perspective and work towards making a better world, a more prepared world going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Amar. Um, Kenny, Ken Snyder, you want to talk to us about the, the virus and the disease itself? Thank you for the opportunity, boss. I appreciate it. I want to thank Dr. Uh, Bill Maggio, thank Drs. Hopkins, um, Siddiqui, and Schweitzberg for the opportunity to participate in this incredible panel. I also want to um, echo some of Bill Maggio's earlier comments. It was amazing to witness the first future of medicine and listen to the discussion around the interconnectedness of, of, of global economies, of global travel, the aging population, and the overcrowdedness of cities and the history of pandemics um, a few every hundred years and know that there was this perfect storm that we would be living what we're currently living through. Um, and echoing some of Dr. Morrison's earlier comments as well, um, as a neurosurgeon that treats acute disease and puts an N95 on when an emergency comes in with my surgical colleagues and works collectively with my emergency room doctors and my um, critical care doctors to treat these patients, we learned anything from the mission statement from the WHO to China, it was to protect the hospital and the healthcare workers at all costs. The healthcare workers in Wuhan were who got infected early and who went home in clusters and infected the surrounding communities. So we quickly learned early on that we needed to protect each other and protect ourselves. As a first major innovation, I'm putting up the Johns Hopkins map of the globe. Um, it's amazing that it was almost the single source of truth that globally we look to for the numbers of cases and the numbers of deaths and all of the trends that we've spoken about recently. 
Um, the other incredible factors, again, it speaks to this has affected the entire world, but just as I've learned from my colleagues within this institution, we've banded together and learned as an entire community about this disease. And as Dr. Morrison pointed out, of not just beating misinformation, but the scientific process itself has helped us calm our fears. A lot of the fear early on was the fear of the unknown, not knowing about this disease. It's the scientific process that combats that. Um, and the scientific process speaks to, you know, this underlying concern um, or fear around, oh, we got everything wrong. That's not how the scientific process works. There's over 3,000 clinical trials going on throughout the entire world, 2,000 of them actively recruiting, 1,000 of them in the United States alone. I think one important factor to start with is, yes, there's almost 30 million cases with 1 million deaths globally and 200,000 deaths in the US. Many people say it's 85% of the people that die from this are 65 and older and they would have died from something anyway. We need to quickly say that that's not true and excess mortality does not prove that to be true. And one death from this terrible disease is too many. There's been over a thousand deaths in healthcare workers alone in the United States. And this is a colleague that we love to work with that passed away from complications of COVID as an x-ray technician within our operating rooms. We see entire families come in and pass away from this disease. And even worse, sometimes we see a single family member survive. When we think of the impact of this disease, the public health measure of excess mortality is a spectacular way to measure this. There are underlying problems with just looking at the way mortality is reported right now. Um, for example, certain countries um, do, may not report mortalities accurately. North Korea states they don't have any uh, cases or any deaths from it. Um, there are certain public, um, the ways they measure it, whether it's hospital death or where it was confirmed with the virus in-house, there's a recent publication that um, came out with some misinformation that stated only 6% of people in the US that died had no comorbidities from COVID. What that really meant was that people weren't filling out the death certificates correctly because you don't die from a primary cause of COVID. You die from complications from it, pneumonia, uh, ARDS, stroke, heart disease. So if the if the death certificates were filled out right, COVID would never have been listed solely as a cause of death. Excess mortality is a measure of the complete impact of a disease process. It looks at in the same time frame as this pandemic, if you look at an average of years prior where there were no other major health issues going on, what was the change in death rate over that time frame? And when you look at Spain, when you look at Italy and you look at the United States on this graph, you can see that Spain had a 140% increase in death rate compared to prior years. Italy had an increase in 100%. That means there were double the number of deaths during this time frame. And if you look at the United States, a longer tail, it reached 50%. When you plot that and look at it over an average death rate of prior years, you see almost 100,000 more deaths than are listed on the Johns Hopkins website. Now, that takes into account then miscalculations uh, in terms of how they're reported, but it also takes into account of the impact in this disease on many other factors like Dr. Morrison brought up. This is a graph of our acute stroke imaging across the US and country. And what happened dramatically with COVID was the numbers of people coming in for stroke evaluations dropped dramatically. The fear and concern was people were so scared to come in the hospital to get COVID that they died at home from strokes also saw the same thing with cardiovascular deaths. And so all of these are taken into account when we use a measure like excess mortality. Dr. Morrison mentioned the importance of flattening the curve and what we did to do that. Earlier on with all of the analytical engines that were done, there was no way of predicting what would happen from all the public health measures. This line right here is the total number of hospital beds available in the region. This red line was the prediction of the number of patients that might be coming into the hospital. The worry with that first wave was the hospital systems would get completely overrun and we wouldn't be able to offer care to people when they came in. What we learned about the public health measures that the most profound and most important, even with shutting down the systems and spacing, physical distancing, was how important masks were. 
early on, we masked every patient that came in the hospital system and masked every healthcare worker. And in doing such, we had half of the prevalence of even the community itself. This is in the hospital system where all of these patients are being taken care of. If we allow that one single measure to flip with all the progress that we've made, we would have massive increases in the number of cases throughout our community. Technology has allowed us to interact and learn from each other in, in incredibly new and innovative ways. Dr. Siddiqui, Dr. Hopkins, their contacts around the world allowed us to get insight into the hospitals in Wuhan and China while they were dealing with this pandemic. We were able to discuss treatments, discuss immediate concerns and issues with the people giving care within that community in that time frame. It also gave us a glimpse from one of my co-fellows, um, David Langer in New York City, in the heart of New York City's swell. Many know him from the Netflix episode. Um, he was a fellow here in Buffalo and is a close friend and colleague. And what he shared with us was over a period of a few weeks, his entire Northwell Lenox Hill hospital system transformed from 50 COVID patients, almost all in medical surge beds, to 300 all in ICUs the entire hospital became an ICU bed. And what to do with all of those patients? They set up um, the Jovit Center and other centers where medical care would then be provided. But it was incredible how rapid we needed to evolve this technology and be able to care for individuals. Along with that innovation has been a technology that we've used sporadically in terms of telehealth, but this allowed us to ramp this up and this, this technology will not go away. It will be with us forever. It allows us, again, to interact with patients in their homes. And what we did learn was it's great for wellness, but it has room for improvement for chronic disease. The more we can actually put the ability to measure things about patients in their homes, the belly will, will better be able to leverage this technology. We spoke an incredible amount about coronaviruses and viruses themselves between species and zoonotic disease. But I think what's also important to mention is that viruses have been around before almost every other living component of the, of the tree. In fact, viruses infect all living things on this planet, including themselves. There must be some strong evolutionary rationale and reason for it, whether it's moving genetic information across species. When we focus on coronaviruses, there are approximately 100 of them. Seven of them affect humans. Four of them cause the common cold, and two have affected us the severe lung disease we've talked about with SARS with the 10% mortality and MERS with the 35% mortality. What is most unique about this new SARS-CoV-2 is it's almost like a blend of all of them. It's allowed the virus to not kill its host at such a lethal rate and be mildly symptomatic that it can spread rampantly through our communities. The vast majority of people are either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. And again, in terms of um, innovation, incredible amounts of innovation has been the ability for us to sequence the genomics and follow the mutations of this throughout the entire world. We're able to map out phylogenetically from China, the blue uh, colors are by region, but look at from China, how it then through each branch of mutation moved through Europe and then was able to move through the Americas and Africa. What is also interesting is it's one of the largest of RNA viruses that exist, but it actually has proteins within it that keep it from making mistakes in itself. It's actually um, fairly largely consistent. The mutation rate is fairly low for this virus. Um, and uh, the Buffalo Group um, and uh, our partners have actually contributed to multiple points along this data set as well. The virus itself is basically a little soap bubble with with a genetic code inside of it and a sticky protein surface that lets it lock and key onto our host cells. Once the virus finds a, a neighboring match within what are called ACE2 receptors, which is what its spike uh, protein binds to, it fuses with the cell membrane and injects its genetic material into the cell. And it basically takes over and hijacks the cell's material to make many, many more copies of itself. It also uniquely makes a protein that goes into the nucleus of the cell and actually stops the cell's ability to signal other cells that there's a virus attacking me. So it actually hides even further um, uh, than other viruses do while it attacks. 
Um, and looking at the Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines, which were updated two days ago and is an incredible resource of all the um, research being done on this. Um, the guidelines um, state and the science is what it is. These are the, the major guideline criteria right now. Hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin is not recommended for hospitalizations, hospitalized patients. Steroids are recommended for severe disease, and that's someone requiring oxygen requirements and some form of mechanical ventilation. Um, in studies with it, it's shown a 20% relative risk reduction or a 3% absolute risk reduction. So the mortality rates on steroids have gone from 24% to 21%. Not dramatic, but it's improvement and it's help. Convalescent plasma is only recommended in clinical trial. Convalescent plasma is taking somebody that's been infected, has, pro has produced antibodies, and using those antibodies in the most severely ill to try and combat the disease. Um, what we know about it is you want high titers and for it to be delivered, delivered early, but we don't have randomized um, data on this yet. And we know that this is a stopgap. It's been used for over 100 years as a stopgap. The antiretrovirals, which were um, useful in SARS, um, remdesivir shows benefit at five days in early patients. Those are maybe requiring oxygen, but not requiring mechanical ventilation. Um, the uh, lipinavir, the ones that affect the ability of the virus itself to replicate, have showed no mortality benefit. Um, as the immune response ramps up in a patient and trying to clear this virus, it can, it can at some point get to a point that's, that's a, an extreme response. And in those extreme responses, um, there are certain messenger systems and this IL-6 inhibitor, tussilizumab, uh, uh, um, is in clinical trial, but at this point has not had any major mortality benefit and no randomized control trial data on that. There's a lot of excitement around monoclonal antibodies and the ability to actually bind the spike protein before it binds to our cells and prevent its ability to infect. Um, very interesting. Um, we have the entire you know, research community working, but we also have the gaming community working. And silently in the background with zero budget and zero authority, all the GPU gamers got together over a period of a few weeks and actually created the world's most powerful supercomputer. Um, in a period of time, um, as starting with the tweet at the end of March, they built a crowdsourced supercomputer that's 10 times more powerful than the computer at Oak Ridge National Labs. And in just four weeks since I last looked at it, it's actually doubled its computing power. Um, right now, there are a million computers working on folding proteins and the ability to block the protein virus from infecting cells. Imagine what this computational power might be able to do if there were a million computers or a billion computers linked together. <clears throat> symptoms from this virus. So we know that there are ACE2 receptors is how the virus binds to get entry into our body. Those receptors are throughout the body. They're in the upper airway. And so not surprising to have symptoms of cough. They're in the lung tissue and deep lung tissue itself contributing to shortness of breath. They're in the olfactory nerves or the, uh, the, the smell nerves. So we have people that have trouble with smell and taste. They're in the lining of the GI tract. So it gives us diarrhea and other symptomatology. And as we move forward, I'll talk about some of the lining in the kidney cells and especially the blood vessels as we think that there's underlying truth that this disease is actually an endothelial disease and where it does its most damage. One other thing published out of Paris recently was the, the, um, the recognition that these symptoms don't just go away quickly. There are many people called long haulers that can have symptoms for three to six months after this, headache, fatigue, and many other neurologic symptomatology. When we looked at 6,000 um, cases in the New York City area, one thing that caught our eye was we expected people with underlying lung disease to be the people that, that would potentially be dying from this disease or coming in sick. And instead, what we found was morbidly obese, cardiovascular, hypertensive patients were who came in. Why would that be? What is unique about that patient population? When you look at that patient population, they're way over on the spectrum of oxidative stress within their bodies. How could that be playing a part? The other interesting reports came from my personal co-fellow, Jay Mako, um, out of Mount Sinai, when he was looking at young patients showing up with strokes, and that around the world, we were noticing that the thrombectomies were not improving the way we'd expect. We'd be pulling clots out of the head for stroke, and they'd be forming clots right before our eyes. Why on earth was that happening? We also noticed that 30% of the severely ill were throwing clots throughout their body. 
MIs, other strokes, pulmonary embolisms. So there was some major prothrombotic state associated with this virus. Postmortem analysis and autopsy showed us that when you looked at the lung and when you looked at other organ systems, there were microclots within the vasculature. So this is a lung that is healthy in the sense that its compliance hasn't changed. It's not filled with pus. It's not filled with fluid. The lung itself would squeeze and open normally, which is why people wouldn't feel like they're having trouble breathing. But there's clots throughout the microcapillaries so that the oxygen exchange can't occur, hence the happy hypoxics. And so what could be going on? We think that this virus is directly affecting the ACE2 cells throughout the body that are part of what's called a renin-angiotensin system, which is really a system made to reduce inflammation. This can also be occurring through bradykinin. We also know that the cell or that the body itself's immune system kills the virus by inflammation and, and um, redox. The other factor is that you've got all these individuals that already have a pro-inflammatory state. And could this be, again, some perfect storm of thrombosis to be occurring within the blood vessels itself? Um, th this information has led to us early on to do very aggressive anticoagulation of almost any patient that comes in with COVID. And in fact, again, Mount Sinai published over 4,000 patients of aggressive anticoagulation continuing for 45 to up to 90 days and are seeing significant reductions in both mortality and the need for intubation. And this has now moved to global randomized controlled trials. We spoke earlier about the incredible work done in, on viruses and the, um, the partnership between government and industry in order to get the vaccines out. But I think what's most unique about these um, vaccines um, is the novelness of their approach. Typically, vaccines are done by infecting a chicken egg and after a period of time, killing that off, taking the dead virus and injecting it in someone to trigger an immune response. And literally, it takes one egg to trigger one vaccine. Um, these novel vaccines are actually taking the genetic material of the virus itself. It's not infective, but taking that material and injecting it directly into humans. And what's happening is the body is taking that genetic material, creating the protein to trigger the immune response. So our own body's immune systems are, are, are triggering the antibody response. And this is getting rid of the whole need to do all of the work that was done in chick eggs before. Same things being done for the spike protein. I think one of the most important things that may change how we approach this pandemic is how we think about testing. Testing is complicated. It's asking the right question uh, to bridge it with the right test. And earlier on, the literature came out to say, boy, a less sensitive test is probably a bad thing. Then we're gonna counter that discussion by say again, it may not be a bad thing from a public health perspective. If someone's infected by the virus, what happens is early on the number of viral copies dramatically increase from the hundreds into the millions range. And when they're in this millions range, this is when somebody could be spewing virus and is most contagious. And then over time, that number slowly hopefully comes down as the body clears the virus. So there's a phase where when someone's over 100,000 to a million copies that it's most probable that they're infectious. PCR tests are a very, very, very sophisticated, sensitive test for detecting virus. It can detect virus in the hundreds of copies range. The issue is that if you're getting someone that's in the hundreds range, they're not likely on the upswing. They're likely well beyond their contagious period. So from a public health perspective, what if we had a test that was cheap, that rapidly told you whether or not you had high numbers of copies, and it was readily available so that it could be used at home. So that instead of getting a test and waiting three, four days for a result, you could literally test yourself every single day. Um, currently, this test was approved um, three weeks ago, one of the Abbott rapid antigen tests. Problem is this still requires a physician in a physician's office. I think one of the main hurdles to make this leap is that we haven't been able to let link the home tests to the public health departments. They need the ability to scan the test and if it's positive, make sure that the health department knows that that individual is positive. Um, again, I think that this is a small hurdle. The technology is there, but the minute that we get these, these tests into the hands of the users in schools and in work, it will dramatically reduce the uh, impact of this disease. And if there was anything to hand down to future generations for future pandemics, it's that we need this level of testing early on. 
Um, I can envision a time frame where as we go through airport security, we also are spitting into a, a small tube and it checking for a series of potential infections or, 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 or viruses. Um, and with that, uh, thank you for the opportunity and I welcome any questions. Wow, that's a lot of information. So um, let's turn it over to Adnan for just a minute to talk a little bit about the Jacobs Institute and the future of medicine that, that we're doing. Adnan? Thank you, Nick. Um, I think this was uh, just a fabulous uh, global perspective from all these different directions from physicians and entrepreneurs and public policy experts, as well as uh, thought leaders thinking about this uh, from a perspective that uh, really allows us to engage uh, in a discussion which is something that is very near and dear to us at the Jacobs Institute. Uh, we are focused on vascular disease, which is the, despite the COVID ep epidemic, is the number one killer of human beings, be it cardiovascular disease or neurovascular disease. And uh, Jacobs Institute um, is interested in using entrepreneurship to really fast track novel technologies to make the human condition better. Uh, we are a 5013C not-for-profit organization and we are really heavily dependent on philanthropic uh, contributions to really make the efforts that we are making in getting novel ideas from people in the trenches uh, people like the doctors and entrepreneurs and engineers who have great ideas uh, to move this process forward. And uh, we utilize opportunities like this to bring real thought leaders forward. The Future of Medicine proposal uh, that was put together under uh, Mr. Jeremy Jacobs sort of cleared it, sort of support uh, to lead this entire exercise was, some, was done with the hope that the Jacobs Institute will continue to play a key role in making future advancements in the art and science of medicine. So I think uh, it's a great opportunity to showcase the kind of talent we can bring together um, virtually in this day and age and in person and others and hopefully in the future uh, to really address the, the most uh, germane and critical problem that is facing humanity right now, which is this epidemic. So thank you, Nick, for that opportunity. And I think it would be great for us to transition into questions. Uh, there are a bunch that we have today through the chat. Uh, there are others that I'm sure Steve and others and myself have for our esteemed colleagues. So uh, Steve, if you want to start off with some questions. Sure. So on the top, uh, Chris Cohan asked a question that's on a lot of people's minds. If these viruses are infecting humans, tell us a little bit from your position of expertise why these viruses aren't actually hurting their hosts. Are we just unlucky? Is this an evolutionary event? I thought it was a great leadoff question from, from Chris to start this off. Ken, you want to take this? They're happy to. Um, again, I think there are other panelists that probably know more deeply, but the bat immune system is unique. Um, it's got an ability to suppress its own immune system in the sense that um, many of us, when our immune systems trigger, they actually scar, they kill off the tissue. And in bats, that's highly, highly suppressed. So they're able to tolerate uh, an infection without damaging the original organs that might be involved. Um, that's one theory that I think is, is bearing out in the literature. Um, the other is a disease that's very severe to us may be nothing but the common cold to them. Steve Galster, what's your take on this question? Well, in fact, there are animals uh, making other animals uh, infected, as we see the coronavirus is passed on to, you know, tigers in a zoo in uh, the Bronx, uh, to mink farms in the Netherlands, the United States. Uh, we've seen bird flu, obviously, we've seen birds infect other birds. Some do get sick, some don't. As a previous speaker said, maybe they've got uh, immune responses already. But I think really um, uh, an important observation from this is there's still way too little cooperation going on uh, between wildlife experts, animal experts in general, and, um, and, 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 and folks in this community. And, you know, for example, we, we work in parks and along the border where people are 
catching wild animals in trade, et cetera. I don't see medical health professionals showing up or even knowing about these incidents. There's all kinds of data that is being lost. Uh, and this, is, this really points to the need for this integrated One Health approach. And I think you know we need to be collaborating. Groups like ours and experts on this panel and people who are watching much more, we've each got our own insights, data, and networks that can be brought together to detect uh, risks like this and prevent them going forward. Because um, we really believe that in this case, the convenient truth is that this problem could be mitigated uh, seriously through a stroke of the pen, which is policy change. One health approach, banning commercial trade in, in, in wild animals and seriously reducing the risk of this happening again because it's gonna happen again. This COVID-19 I think is very weak compared to the next pandemic unless we face the fact that these are zoonotic outbreaks and therefore, you know, what are those factors behind it, the push-pull factors? Wildlife trade and destruction of wild habitat. So thank you. So on your, when you opened up your share screen, we saw your dog. I happen to live in a neighborhood that had a tremendous number of dogs and the behavior amongst dog owners has, has changed a lot with the pandemic where you don't really stop and have dogs sniff each other. Uh, what is your take on human to canine or human to feline transmission? Should dog owners be afraid? You can go into your doctor's office, but you can't get anywhere near inside a veterinarian's office right now what what's your take on the on the human animal relationships right now you you're asking me oh yeah okay well yeah yeah i am a a, a big animal lover and you saw my beagle before uh, but you know right in the beginning uh, the experts pointed out that um, uh, cats domestic cats and big cats could be infected but dogs were were safe uh, and so far that does seem to be borne out but um, i Again, I just think the big picture here is I'm just amazed that we're, we're not focusing more on this huge trade. You know, the illegal trade in wild animals alone is around $20 billion a year. The legal trade is in several hundred billion dollars a year. We're taking animals out of their natural environment. They could be bringing, taking any kind of virus with them that does not make them or fe fellow animals sick because they're coming from that same environment, we're taking them out, sticking them in the city, crossing borders, putting them on ships, planes. <laughs> These are viral bombs in, in transport. So I think our, our, main, our main focus really should be on wild animals because they're, they're coming from an environment that we don't. And that's, we need to protect nature and nature will protect us. You know, you know, Kenny, we took a pretty hard line on testing, particularly in endoscopy. There's been some recent discussion about fecal oral transmission, sewage. I haven't kept up on this. Do you have any insights from what you've been following? Because I know you, you track these things. We're, you know, we're making people crazy about COVID tests before colonoscopy. Not everybody realizes how important colonoscopy is. When we get tens of thousands of endoscopies behind, that's a lot of cancer that's not being diagnosed. What do we know about... Uh, fecal transmission of this disease? Sure. <clears throat> so when we kill off this disease or this virus, we, we shed it. And so what can happen with the PCR tests, which just look for small sequences of the RNA, not living virus, is that we're able to detect components of the virus, dead virus, in stool, in urine, in other samples. Those end up in our uh, water supply. And so we are able with those very sensitive PCR tests from a public health measure to actually check if there's spikes in those um, signatures of dead virus within water supplies. And from a public health measure, it's being explored in terms of, can this help us isolate or figure out testing? I had thought through this idea of, boy, if there's RNA um, of the virus in our water supply and we're trying to inject RNA in us to produce a response, is this a way evolutionarily for a immunity to actually build immunity. The infectious disease and virologists tell me that it's too denatured to do that, but I thought that was an exciting idea. Um, so right now they're not culturable, it's thought to be dead virus, and it seems to be a measure for public health at this point. It's a lot of in the press. Um, Amar, there was a supply chain question. One of my partners had trouble finding a refrigerator. You can't find one. You obviously can't buy a webcam. 
What are the big supply chain uh, deficits that you've seen in the med tech industry? So I think there's two types. You know, one is uh, the med tech industry, as you know, relies on uh, certainly uh, several components coming from places like China and several materials. So um, uh, I think initially those were under pressure and, uh, but they seem to have recovered uh, okay. And I think things are more or less back to normal. Flights are going, stuff is coming. So we, we've recently been, we've got polymer suppliers in China and, and that's been working. We have seen some problem because the med tech industry also relies on a number of uh, uh, smaller, whether they're extruders or designers or uh, sterilizers or ca catheter manufacturers, or, you know, all kinds of uh, outsourced uh, uh, vendors. And uh, those, because of the issues that I highlighted of social distancing and uh, how many people can be there in one place and uh, including people who probably have gotten sick, et cetera, are under pressure. And uh, we do find some delays uh, taking place uh, in that, uh, especially in the United States. So um, you know, uh, testing is also for, you know, preclinical testing, et cetera. Uh, running these studies is becoming harder. We can't go in person. So that leads to some uh, programmatic delays also. Uh, Kenny, Kathy has kind of an interesting person question. You were a little vague on the uh, chloroquine and azithromycin making a clear statement in hospitalized patients. She wants to know about uh, what about ambulatory patients? Sure. So um, first of all, with the azithromycin, um, when someone has a um, viral infection affecting their lungs and killing off those cells, those dead cells can slough down into the lung and block airways. And actually that's what pus and pneumonia is. When you have that level of congestion, you can have a secondary bacterial infection. If anyone shows signs of that, that's what the antibiotics are for. The question is, um, a lot of the studies are on the most ill patients in the hospital. And what we don't see a lot of studies on is what could prevent people from coming into the hospital? How do we boost our innate immune systems? What things shift how many people truly become ill? Um, so the population where the um, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin group was often given to, which was outpatient, largely may have been a mild to asymptomatic patient population that wouldn't come in. The other factor is hydroxychloroquine is probably a zinc ionophore. It probably transports zinc into the cell, which has antiviral properties. So without that piece to the picture, I don't think it's complete. Basically, more studies needed, um, but there is a component for antibacterials only when they show signs of infection in the lung, not right up front for everybody. Let me turn this back to Adnan, who has a few more questions. You're, you're muted, Adnan. Thank you. So, Steve, a question for you. Um, it appears um, that this is really, truly affecting almost every single country in the world. I think Antarctica might be the only place where it has not affected people yet. Um, is there a, a movement afoot? I think um, our Stephen from CSIS did mention uh, uh, a global uh, policy movement that would start addressing this theoretical concern for pandemics into more of a political movement that clearly is central to addressing the issue that affects you the most, but also in terms of coordinating the concerns that have been raised by, about WHO performance are also germane to the same conversation as to how they could be worldwide policy measures that could be undertaken to prevent these occurrences. Now, I understand the zoonotic disease would be significantly limited if the, the commercial market went away, but there's still the overcrowding and deforestation and all those other elements that contribute to this. So there are policy measures that are needed which are similar to climate change measures that are needed. So, where is that? Can you inform us as to if there is a movement afoot to put together a worldwide body to look at this? Yeah, well, there, there is a movement afoot, but it's not as strong and sharp as it should be. The good news is that the WHO, United Nations Environment Program, other notable international organizations are speaking with one voice, and they are advocating for this one health approach basically integrating communities like the one that's here today with nature protectors, 
and other sectors. So we're protecting animals, people, and ecosystems all at the same time. In addition to uh, you know the wildlife trade, really uh, it's all also as you mentioned, it's not just about stopping wildlife trade. It's about uh, stopping destruction of wild habitat. And there you've got to see reform in the agricultural sector because um, a lot of this disease also jumps out of uh, domesticated animals, factory farming, et cetera. So basically it, it points to the need for more, what we would call compassionate, sustainable farming, uh, which is you know ethically and morally good, but also it's, it's, it, it, it uh, lends to better human health uh, and, and, and planetary health. Uh, so these are the, these are, that's the good news. The bad news is, is that um, there's compromise again. And that's because there's just so much money being made in the wildlife trade. And also, obviously, it's going to be very difficult to modify the agricultural sector, which is run by big companies that are making a lot of money selling, you know, lots of chickens, pigs, cows, et cetera, and, and, and crowding them all, all together. So international organizations, <clears throat> we talk to <clears throat> WHO, UNEP, and others, and basically they represent their, their, their clients, their members. Uh, so I think we, this is why we put our campaign together and pandemics was to try to spark and lead governments. You know, my, I work with governments for the last 30 years. And one thing I've learned is that you don't wait for the governments to lead. You plant ideas in their heads. Uh, they're big organizations. They can't move quickly. And largely what we feel in this case is we've been failed by governments and international organizations. Uh, but your point about the <clears throat> climate change, we need to learn from that too. <clears throat> Our progress on climate change mitigation has been way too slow. It's become way too political. And, but the convenient truth here is that uh, world leaders can lick this problem with the stroke of the pen by banning commercial trade mod animals and adopting this one health approach so we can speed up together, all work together and prevent the next pandemic. Because like I said, you know, all signs indicate the next one's gonna be even worse than this. And we don't wanna go through this again. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Amar, I had a question for you in regards the impact this pandemic is having on healthcare systems. So if you look at the reports of healthcare systems, and I'm sure maybe Bill can chime in after Amar as well on this, is that uh, the loss for healthcare systems are at a minimum tens of millions of dollars and on average hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's happening nationally. Um, and these were systems already who had been running on margins which were in the low single digits when they were healthy. Um, now that's the state of our healthcare status. How does that compute with the sort of additional measures that we have to deal with uh, in terms of uh, incorporating uh, novel technologies, which are typically an upfront cost in a lot of situations. How does that affect us? Or is this pandemic going to put us behind for five or 10 years in terms of thinking of novel technologies? And as an entrepreneur, we clearly, I think there are some opportunities with telemedicine and diagnostics and remote treatment and robotics, but the overwhelming majority uh, uh, is going to be affected because the people who pay your bills are really hurting. Uh, does there need to be a federal response? I'm talking similar to the PPP response for individuals. Does there need to be a healthcare response to sort of prop up these systems that are fledgling? So I think you know, that's a good point. Uh, the healthcare systems are already under stress and this uh, only increases the stress further. But I think if there was ever an argument to be made for prophylaxis, this is as elegant an argument that can ever be made. You know, We talk about prophylaxis for say, Alzheimer's saying, what could we be doing to, what could we modify in our diet or something else for, it's very difficult to actually figure out because it's very difficult to figure out a test for Alzheimer's you know, to know whether or not somebody has it or is progressing or, you know, how bad are they getting? But the good news here is there is a, you know, there are very good testing possibilities and, uh, you know, tests that yield pretty good results very quickly and can be made fairly low cost. So home 
kind of testing and prophylaxis are things that need to be done and the reimbursement systems need to come into play so that there isn't a disincentive for people to do that. If you start doing that early enough and catching these things early enough and making it at a less penalty, less inconvenient for people, you will be able to arrest a lot of the things. And my suspicion is, and I think I'll let Ken comment upon it, is that a number of these medicines that we have been trying, because it's very difficult to make a fundamentally new medicine right now, and you know, it's like building a parachute when you've already jumped out of the plane kind of a thing. So you're repurposing a lot of the medicines and the repurposed medicines will work to some extent at the earliest stages of disease before the virus has overwhelmed the systems because it would catch things when it's replicating at the early days and whether it is convalescent plasma or whether it is remdesivir or whatever else, uh, these things will catch stuff early. So the more you can do testing and identify who is either asymptomatic and a viral carrier, uh, which is a, a big problem, uh, and secondly, somebody who is, uh, you know, at the earliest stages of disease before they've progressed. So you can prevent both the spread as well as the morbidity and mortality that could be generated by some of these really early interventions. And we need to make sure that the systems, and if the government needs to step in and provide the economic incentive, I would say that would be a pittance compared to what they've been spending on the PPP and all of the other programs that are doing. So I think re-architecting how we administer healthcare will be needed. And this is a poster child for a case of prophylaxis and early intervention. Mm, There's one last question in the chat about how do we prevent this in the future? And I think we need to immunize our electorate and we will immunize them with education. Stephen Morrison's not with us, but he really alluded to the fact that uh, the lack of science, the politicizing of the issues, and the only way to prevent that disease is to, through STEM education and science education, long after people graduate from high school and college. And that will be our best immunity to make sure the programs are funded, that our pandemic response after we get through this are funded. And we really do have a moral obligation to make our electorate smarter so that we will be immune to the politicizing of these issues in the future. Bill, I think you wanted to have the last word. Thank you so much, Stephen. What a, a wonderful conversation. Uh, so well-rounded, informative discussion. I want to thank Ken and, and Dr. Morris and Steve, Amar, and certainly uh, our moderators, uh, Dr. Hawkins and Dr. Siddiqui and, and, and Dr. Schweitzberg. Um, very rarely do I feel like we can continue to go on for another hour and people will be fully engaged. Uh, so my, my hat's off to everybody. I want to thank you all for joining us for this webinar. Uh, please follow us on social media. Uh, visit our website. Uh, and stay tuned uh, for our next podcast episode, which we're going to release this coming Monday. And I'm happy to say that my guest will be Dr. Steven Schweitzberg. We had a very interesting conversation, and I think you all will enjoy it. So uh, with this, I wish you all a good evening. Uh, safe travels to those who are traveling, and, 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 and have, a, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you.